Have you ever looked at someone and decided that there was no hope for them? The reality is no one, no one but God has the right to look upon another and pass judgment on them. We're continuing the study of the book of Hebrews. The focus in this series has been Jesus as our perfect sacrifice. What does it mean to have Jesus as our sacrifice? Paul in Hebrews indicates that the death of Jesus on the cross ended the need for animal sacrifices. However, this is not to say that offerings do not have a role to play in our lives. Jesus did say to pick up your cross and follow him. And Paul admonishes us to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable to God. Thus, in the, this series of lessons, we learned about Jesus, our perfect sacrifice, and what it means for us to become living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. Holy Father, we are grateful that Jesus robed himself in humanity and became our righteous judge. By this we know judging others is not appointed to us. We have barely the ability to discipline ourselves. Thus, in the name of Jesus Christ, help us never place ourselves on the judgment seat. For in doing this, we take the seat of Christ. We admit that we are guilty, and for this we ask forgiveness. We ask for you to help us walk in subjection to Jesus and take our humble position as servant. In Jesus' name, amen. The key text for this series of lessons is Hebrews 10, 14. It says, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. As sinners, we all deserve death. But God in his loving mercy gave us his son to die for our sins. When we accept Jesus' death for our sins, we are saved because of the cross. God forgives us for our sins because of the cross. The following text let us better understand what God has done in our behalf. Romans 3, 22 through 26 says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then Romans 1, 16 through 17 says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in the righteousness of Christ is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And then finally, Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So what did Jesus do to save us? He gave us his son. We as sinners take on his righteousness. Hence, we can in Christ's righteousness stand before God, our Father. 
Is his salvation limited to any special group of people? No. Jesus died for everyone. All who accept him as their savior is forgiven. The forgiveness we obtain from God is displayed in the work that Jesus does for us in the temple in heaven. Like the service in the earthly temple, which is a copy of the heavenly temple, the scripture indicates that forgiveness is done in two phases. First, Jesus removes our sins. He carries our sins himself on the cross to provide forgiveness to everyone who believes in him as in Acts 2.38 and Acts 5.31. Acts 2.38 says, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 5.31 says, him God has exalted to his hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. On the cross, Jesus won the right to forgive anyone who believes in him because he has carried our sins. He also has established a new covenant, a new agreement, which allows him to put God's law in the mind of those who believe. He does this through the power of the Holy Spirit, who works with Jesus to put the law inside us as indicated in Hebrews 8, 10 through 12 and Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. Hebrews 8, 10 through 12 says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For while I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. In Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27 says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. But in the first phase, Jesus removes our sins. The second phase in the ministry of Jesus consists of a judgment. This judgment is a time when God judges everyone on the earth. This work occurs during the end time. We're living in the end times, thus we are in the time of this judgment. The following text gives us some clues about this judgment. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. It says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels prove steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience receives its just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Hebrews 6, 2 says, of the doctrine of baptism, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. In Hebrews 9, 27 through 28, and as it is appointed for man to die once, but after this, the judgment. 
So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. In Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Who's judged first? The judgment begins with God's people as described in Revelation 14, 7. Revelation 14, 7 says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. What is the purpose of this judgment? It's designed to show the righteousness of God and forgiving his people. The work that God does as our judge will show everyone, everyone, that he is fair and right when he forgives us. In this judgment, the records of our lives will be open for the entire universe to see. It allows all the creatures in heaven to look at the life records of all the people of God. God allows them to see what happened in the hearts of his people. He will show them how they changed from the better when they embraced Jesus as their savior and accepted his spirit in their hearts and lives. Speaking of this judgment, here is what one author wrote. Man cannot meet these charges himself. In his sin-stained garment, confessing his guilt, he stands before God. But Jesus, our advocate, presents an actual plea in behalf of all who, by repentance and faith, have committed the keeping of their souls to him. He pleads their cause and vanishes their accuser by the mighty argument of Calvary. His perfect obedience to God's law, even unto the death of the cross, has given him all power in heaven and in earth. And he claims of his father's mercy and reconciliation for guilty men. But while we should realize our sinful condition, we ought to rely upon Christ as our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. We cannot answer the charges of Satan against us. Christ alone can make an effectual plea in our behalf. He's able to silence the accuser with arguments founded not upon our merits, but on his own. The cross and the ministry of Jesus in our behalf suggests that we should look confidently, but with humility and repentance toward the judgment. Now, that is a message for us today. 